living for many years in a, a smaller town uh, without the big box stores and, and really before Amazon became a thing, um, you tended to fix things that people normally would just would buy new when it breaks. And then when people came to town, and we always had an influx every year of a, a bunch of new people coming and going, they've always had different issues and they need something fixed, and I would tend to, the longer I'm there, I, I knew a lot of people. And so for these unique things that are broken, I often knew a guy, right? Uh, my staff say, hey, um, brought their bike off the moving truck, my, my bike's broken. We didn't have a bike shop in town. But I said, I, I know a guy. He lived on Janet Lane. I didn't know his phone number, but when you drove by and his door was open, garage door, you'd see the bikes inside, and you knew he would fix your bike. Just walk in. He won't mind. Right? Uh, you have a nice pair of dress shoes. Soul comes off. I know a guy. It's the village cobbler on 2nd Street. Uh, don't be afraid when you go in there. He has piles of shoes. He's a little bit gruff. He actually has a working black and white TV with the antenna still on it. Um, state your business clearly, quickly. Do not ask when your shoes will be done. He will take care of it. He'll give you a little slip of paper. Just say thank you and just walk out the door. It works a lot better for you. Oh, your watch is broken. I knew a guy. Lived up by the hospital. He fixes your watch at his kitchen counter. Um, it's not weird when he invites you in. Be okay with that. He'll get it done. Right? I just knew a lot of people to get things fixed. Fast forward to today, um, when people have issues, they often come to me too, but the issues are much different than my watch, my bike, or my dress shoes need repair. They'll say, um, Pastor, my mom died. They'll say, Pastor, I I've been diagnosed with cancer and I'm struggling. Pastor, my marriage is a mess. Pastor, I, I'm just always worried. Right? They come to me because I'm a pastor, but they also come to me because they know that I know a guy. Right? And it makes total sense to me, and, and I'm more than happy to talk with people when all those different problems happen. And very often, as, as we talk about the issue and, and we, we, we air it out there, at the end of the conversation, what makes the most sense right, is that we just pray. That's really all we can do. You know a guy, too, but I, I do think that what I'm trying to say is that for most of us, including myself, my prayers always seem to be attached to when something goes wrong or some issue is in my life. Even not even a big issue. It could be even a minor issue. But that's when I say, oh, now I can pray. Or I maybe mean, I should probably pray about that. Or, right, that, that phrase might use, well, all we can do now is just pray after all of our solutions don't seem to work. And yet, if you read the Bible when it talks about prayer, it says, pray unceasingly, pray continually. Jesus says, pray with shameless audacity. Uh, the scripture says, pray and never give up. Right? Th this constant theme in scripture to pray all the time. And yet, it doesn't seem to match up a lot with our spiritual disciplines of prayer because we tend to pray when needed or pray during those normal situations that you got brought up to pray in. Lunch, breakfast, maybe breakfast, supper, and then pray before I go to bed. That's why I think this idea of what I wish I'd known sooner about the necessity of prayer is a really important thing. And it makes sense too as the Apostle Paul speaks about it. Because when you think about people of prayer, right, I was thinking to myself, who do I know that are people of prayer? If you think to yourself, well, who would you say that is a man or a woman of prayer, if you get a, the person in your mind, I am guessing there's a good chance that person is older than you. Or remember when you were younger, that person was older than you. Right, because very often people of prayer are people that are older. It's not that they're better Christians than somebody else, but I think, right, as you get older, you start to realize things that you've seen a lot of different things in your life. 
and you see the good and the bad, the different struggles you've gone through, and you've seen God's hand in that, and so you are much more comfortable praying to God on a regular basis because you know who he is and what he's done. I guess I don't want us to wait until we're at a certain age to realize how wonderful and how important prayer is in our life. And that's why this morning we're going to look at the Apostle Paul's words, and he's going to help us understand why and how to make prayer more a, a, more a part of your life and just really see the necessity of prayer by these opening verses um, in the second chapter of Timothy. It says this, Paul writes, I urge then, first of all, that petitions prayers, intercession, thanksgiving made for all people, for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Paul gives a, a list of different types of prayers. Before we get into that a little bit, really, if you think about prayer, I think there's really two ways we pray, right? You pray the prayers that you were taught growing up. Maybe before bedtime, moms and dads, right, we, we teach our kids to pray, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray, Lord, my soul to keep. May angels watch me through the night until I wake in morning's light. Or we teach to pray the Lord's Prayer, or come Lord Jesus, be our guest. Maybe in catechism class, you might remember Martin Luther's morning and evening prayers. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son. Right? Those kind of prayers kind of help us to articulate what different requests we can make to God. Or we can talk about prayer another way. Is we use the phrase, it's Latin phrase, ex corde, from the heart. Right? Just something on your mind and you just pray to God. Maybe you're you're home feeling sick and, and you just say a quick prayer. Or you're scrolling through Facebook and you see an issue in someone's life and instead of just writing prayers underneath there as a response, you actually do write prayers and then actually pray, right? Just whatever words are there. And I think we know that prayer is communication with God, but I think there's a better definition that really helps us shape our prayers and why we pray. I want to use this definition. It's a man named Tim Kelly. It's a, he's now in heaven. It says in a book he wrote on the prayer, he says, prayer is a personal communicative response to the knowledge of who God is. Right? You saw that in the prayer of Habakkuk. No grapes, no olives, no animals. And what was his prayer? Not, God, give me grapes, olives, and animals, but I rejoice in God my Savior. And it talked about the sovereignty, which means the control and care that God has over everything. The Apostle Paul, as he talks about prayer, connects it to his knowledge of who God is. Look what he says. It's God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. It's actually God our Savior. I don't know if you notice Habakkuk used that same phrase. Um, Paul uses the same phrase. It's not used that often to connect God our Savior. We, we say Jesus our Savior, not usually connected with God. But think about that's who God is. God is our Savior. God, th th that's his goal. He wants all people to be saved. And you think about how the Bible describes him, um, that he gives food when we need it that he formed you and made you in your mother's womb, that he has forgiven your sins as far as the east is from the west, right? All of those different attributes about who God is and the knowledge of who God is makes us understand, okay, I get it now. I can pray to God knowing the sovereignty of God with my knowledge of God. If that's the truth, then why do so often our prayers only happen when we need or want something, when life is not going the way we like it to go, when we're facing some major obstacle. I think the truth might be that at times we just don't think it matters or it doesn't really work. Here's what I'm thinking. The claw game, 
if you ever played it, uh, right? Well, maybe when you were younger, you, you played this game. Maybe you still play it now. No shame in that. Um, but right, when you play the claw game, it is fun when you're young, right? You get the quarters or 50 cents from mom and dad, and you, you put your money in there, and you're trying to get that stuffed animal. Maybe it's cash in a little box. Maybe it's an electronic device. And the thing about the claw game that makes it really exciting is you actually think you can win. And, there, and it picks it up, and it gets it high, and you start to move it, and boom, it then drops it. And you do it again, picks it up, it gets it closer, but it always seems to drop the prize right before you're going to win. And here's what the claw game conditions you. As you're younger, you're excited about it because you have this idea that I'm good enough, I can, I can win. But then the older you get, you realize you never win. And the claw game in most places, is just a ripoff. And so you stop playing. Think about your prayers. A loved one is sick and you pray to God for healing and the person isn't healed. You're struggling in your job and this new position is available and you pray to God, God, it's, it's not for money, it's just for, just for family and all the, all the right things, at least in your mind, and you're still stuck in the same spot, right? You prayed for your just a little more peace in marriage and get along with your spouse and it's a good prayer and it's something that, you, like, the outcome's going to be good and it never seems to work. And so you have these requests and these prayers for seemingly good things. And over and over and over again, what you prayed for never happened. And you think, it doesn't really matter. I think here's the issue with that. Those kind of prayers aren't connected to the knowledge of God as much as they are connected to your own wants and your own needs. And don't misunderstand that. It is not wrong to pray for any of that. Uh, man, man, this week I prayed for one of our members who has been in pain and sick for weeks now. And my prayer had been pretty specific. God, please relieve the pain. For days now, it started as a prayer for a father that was missing Lord, just let us find him, to now the prayer is, Lord, just let us find the body, and very specific. And it's not wrong to be specific. It's not wrong to pray to God for wants and needs, but when you shape your prayers, not based on what you need, as much as based on who God is, you're able better to accept the outcomes that you see God working in your life. And this is why. Notice how Paul connects it to who God is, but especially this at the end. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Notice how Paul connects it to God's will for all people and what God has done for all people. We always pray, right, in Jesus' name. But for the Apostle Paul, as he looked at who God was, he understands that God has taken care of what I needed the most, which was to have my sins forgiven. And if God is going to do that for me, how much more all of the other little things in life? Right, Jesus said that in the parable. Right? If a child asks for a loaf of bread, you're not going to give him a snake. Well, how much more will our Father in heaven give everything that we need? So you start to see that when you connect it to this, that it helps you pray now continue. That's why the Apostle Paul begins with these things. Pray, use petitions and prayers and intercession and thanksgiving. When he goes those litany of different kinds of prayers, you start to see this is an everyday thing. So a petition is simply a request for a need. Right? Um, whatever you're going through in your life right now, God says, bring it to me in prayer. A prayer is a general word for all kinds of prayers. Uh, intercession, that means you're praying on behalf of somebody else. And thanksgiving, 
right? You are just giving thanks for the different gifts that God has given you. And notice that when Paul is praying these kind of things, he gives an example of one of his prayers that fit his example of who God is. He says, now then, pray for kings and all in authority that they may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So notice his specific prayer for those in authority. It is connected to the fact that God wants all people to be saved. And so he wants, the prayer is, hey, Lord, I pray for my leaders so we can live without being disturbed and in peace. Because when you can live in peace, when you have good government, when you have laws and when you have protection, then you start to realize that the church can work really well. That the gospel can be spread in places that are under control and places where everyone can function in a good way. So Paul's prayers were shaped with his knowledge of God. When you read his prayers uh, throughout his letters, 30 or more times Paul writes a prayer. And his prayers often say things like, I thank God for your faith. I thank God for the grace given to you. Uh, I'm in thanksgiving for the faith of your mother. I, I pray that you do no evil. Almost all of them have to deal with spiritual matters. Rarely, if ever, did Paul pray for a change in a person's circumstance. Even though they were in poverty, being persecuted, uh, separated from family. But you see why it's one versus the other? Because Paul sees what's important to God. God, Paul sees who God is and what he's going to do. But it doesn't mean Paul never prayed that way. One of the more famous prayers of the Apostle Paul, we're not sure what was wrong with him. It's called his thorn in the flesh. Whatever it was, it was causing Paul having an issue with preaching the gospel. So he said it, it was pretty serious, and this was his prayer. He goes, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. God, take it away. God, take it away. God, take it away. And the answer was no. 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 And then notice God's specific answer. God's grace is sufficient. It wasn't Paul, I'm stopping, I'm going to pray now because it doesn't work. And so when Paul understood and trusted in God, his reaction to that phrase, my love for you is sufficient, is this. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You start to see the knowledge of who God is and, and how he worked in Paul's life allows him to look at circumstances entirely differently. Just like Habakkuk, who thanks God even though life is terrible, Paul thanks God even though he is weak and frail and having issues. Because through the weak and the frail, God's power is made known. When I would teach seniors in high school, um, early on, uh, I would have them take a, uh, a, do a reading log of the Bible and a prayer journal, trying to teach them to, to pray every day and to read the Bible every day. And so it was an assignment. I did collect them. And after like a month or two, I would grab them from the seniors. But I, I wouldn't hand them back. And they were used to that. I didn't hand a lot of things back at times. But that was a purposeful not handing back. I would hand them back to those that were in my class in the second semester and I'd tell them, take a look at the prayers that you wrote down there. And it's interesting, there was kind of a lot of smiles, and what they cared about in September, they forgot about in May. And maybe the little issues and whatever was going on in their lives in September was all taken care of. Or they probably even realized that was a problem because life has changed a hundred different times since then but I'm sure they saw, th saw things they prayed about that the answers they were looking for just wasn't there too. But here's what that little exercise did. They're able to see 
at a young age, in real time, God's hand in their life. God's hand in their life that also connected to their prayer life. And if you've struggled in that world, if you can relate to the idea that I keep on praying for things and they just don't seem to go the way I expect them to go, or you start to think in yourself, God's maybe not listening to me, start to write it down. Not a big, long, serious journal. It's not that hard. Just jot a few things down, put a little date there, have it next to your bed. Start doing that on a regular basis. And what's really interesting is months from now, you'll go back and you'll look at that and you'll see the hand of God in your life. And you'll see God's hand connected to who God is his sovereignty, that he's in control, his love and his care for you. And maybe, just maybe, what you asked for never came to happen. But like the Apostle Paul, you'll be able to say, God's grace was sufficient. God's power is always made perfect in my weakness. For when I'm weak, God's strong. So I go to God in prayer. Not just for the issues in life, but every day. Knowing that God listens, God cares, and God's in control. Amen.